Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for braving the Iowa cold to come out to the lecture tonight. My name is Robert Horton, and I'm a parishioner at St. Thomas Aquinas Church, and I want to welcome you to the lecture tonight. This lecture is sponsored by St. Thomas Catholic Student Center, ISU Committee on Lectures, which is funded by the GSB. It's also part of the 60th anniversary celebration of St. Thomas Aquinas Church and Catholic Student Center. So we really are glad that you're here to help us with that celebration. Our lecturer is Ralph Martin. Ralph Martin has been a leader in renewal movements in the church for many years, the author of several books, articles, and audio albums on contemporary issues in the life of the church and the teachings of the saints. He's currently director of graduate programs in the new evangelization at Sacred Heart Major Seminary in the Archdiocese of Detroit, and he's an assistant professor of theology. He leads the work of Renewal Ministries, an organization devoted to Catholic renewal and evangelization, and hosts the weekly television program, The Choices We Face. And I think his program is available here in Ames on EWTN station. He and his wife, Anne, are parents of six children, grandparents of six, and they reside in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I've known Ralph for 16 years. I've had a chance to travel with him on several uh, missionary trips in Eastern Europe, and I have a lot of admiration for him. I'm really happy that he's here tonight. The title of his lecture is Wisdom of the Mystic Saints. Please join me in welcoming Ralph Martin. I hear it's 50 degrees here yesterday. <laughs> Something happened. I was trying to think about if I saw this title of a lecture, whether I would come to it or not. Well, first of all, saints are a little esoteric to begin with. You know, they're kind of people up there or over there or whatever. But then when you add mystic saint, it seems even kind of further out, you know. And one of the amazing things I've discovered, well, I first tried to read John of the Cross when I was a senior at Notre Dame. And uh, I, I knew there was some depth of wisdom in some of these great doctors of the church. But when I picked up, I, I started with the wrong book, I think. It was The Ascent of Mount Carmel, which is really kind of hardcore tough. And uh, when I was reading it, I stopped after about maybe 60 or 70 pages because I didn't feel, I didn't feel like I understood what was going on, to tell you the truth. I, mean, I felt like what I did understand was kind of challenging, dark, difficult, not attractive. And then about 30 years later, I was in Zurich, Switzerland, flying back to the United States, and through a whole series of circumstances, I was just about to reread a, a spiritual canticle by John of the Cross, and actually read it for the first time. And uh, in that airport in Zurich, uh, it's like all the lights started to go on, like everything I'd ever felt or experienced or desired, every, every beauty of creation, every, every contact with Christ uh, was really starting to kind of all come together in, a, in an understanding that I found really amazing and very, very personally helpful. And so that began a, a new phase of the journey for me. And I, I said, who, I needed to know more about who John of the Cross was. I, I needed to know if there was other people like him. Uh, I found out he was one of the 33 doctors of the church recognized by the Catholic Church as not only a saint, but also as somebody who had been given a special gift of teaching, of wisdom that's useful for the universal church. And I wondered if there were other guys like him, uh, you know, amongst these 33 doctors. And I found out that some of these doctors of the church were recognized as doctors or teachers par excellence because of their... Uh, expertise in interpreting scripture. Others were recognized because of their expertise in countering heresy. Others in their work in systematic theology, like St. Thomas Aquinas, after which the, the parish here uh, is, is named. But I found out that seven of them were mainly focused or, or significantly focused on the spiritual journey. 
how you get from the first moments of faith or the first uh, reality of baptism to the beatific vision, to heaven. How do you get to see God face to face, starting way back at the beginning when, you, when you're baptized or when you first believe? And uh, doctors of the church like St. Augustine, for example, and his uh, tremendous uh, study of conversion and the confessions, doctors of the church like St. Bernard of Clairvaux and his commentary on the Song of Songs, uh, Catherine of Siena, uh, couldn't read or write until Jesus taught her how to read so that they could pray together the Psalms. Uh, died at the age of 33. Uh, never formally studied theology, but recognized by the Catholic Church as one of the, the 33 doctors of the Church because of the wisdom that she received directly from the Lord in prayer. Doctors of the Church like John of the Cross, uh, St. Teresa of Avila, uh, St. Francis de Sales, who wrote the first work of spirituality designed specifically for lay people. And then uh, St. Therese of Lisieux, who is the most recently recognized doctor of the church, uh, a, a, a girl from France who died at the age of 24, again, who never studied formally theology. So you have great scholars with you know, tremendous degrees and tremendous scholarly works like St. Thomas Aquinas, who's one of the 33 doctors of the church, then you have people like Therese and Catherine who never formally, or Teresa of Avila who never formally studied theology but received a, a depth of wisdom that the church recognizes as having universal uh, application. Now I'd like to, before I share some of the wisdom from these saints about the spiritual journey, I'd like to share something else that happened uh, in, in 2001. On January 6, 2001, Pope John Paul II published a document called Novo Millennio Ineunte, which is the Latin for the beginning of the new millennium. And in that document he says, let's step back and ask ourselves, what has the Holy Spirit been doing for the last 40 years? Since the beginning of the Second Vatican Council, which, which for non-Catholics who may be present, was a, a renewal council in, in, in the Catholic Church that tried to re- reorder the church towards a more biblical, more spiritual, more Trinitarian, more evangelization-oriented focus. Uh, and he said, what, what has the Holy Spirit been doing for the last 40 years? And he picked out three things that he feels like the Spirit particularly has been drawing our attention to. The first of these is he says the Holy Spirit has led us to rediscover the universal call to holiness. That holiness isn't just for a few special people. It's not just for what the Catholic Church talks about as canonized saints. But it's for every single Christian. That holiness isn't for a few special people, but it's for every single Christian who's called to the fullness of holiness. Well, maybe before we go much further, we should give a little definition of what holiness is. All of us have a picture that comes into our mind when we hear the word holiness. Maybe it's of somebody kneeling in church. Maybe it's somebody who says a lot of prayers. Maybe it's somebody who's fasting. We have different pictures in our mind of what holiness is. Maybe we think of Mother Teresa or whatever. But the essence of holiness is love. And what it means to grow in holiness is to grow in love. Because what this is all about, after all, is love. To love God with our whole mind and soul and strength and our neighbor as ourself. And so growing in holiness is growing in the capability of receiving love and giving love. Teresa Avila gives a, a related definition of holiness. She says what it means to grow in holiness is to grow in union with the will of God. Uh, St. Catherine of Siena said that the greatest suffering on earth isn't physical suffering. But it's a suffering comes that comes to the depth of the human personality when it's in opposition to God's will. So she says the greatest suffering is suffering that comes into our life through when we resist or oppose or say no in some way to the, the purpose for which we were created, you know, God's will for our life. And that the agony and the depths of our being of, of resisting God's will or opposing God's will uh, is, is a greater suffering than even physical suffering. So Teresa of Avila says then that bringing our will into union with God's will 
is of the essence of holiness, coming to love what God loves and want what God wants and rejoice in who God is and what his plan is for our life. The second area that Pope John Paul II picked out is the Holy Spirit restoring a focus to us today and is that the church is not just an institution or organization or an ethnic grouping, but it's a communion of love. That God himself is a communion of love, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in an immense uh, intensity of interpersonal love, and that God has created us to share in that interpersonal love, and that the church is not primarily an institution or organization, but it's a place where we can kind of become caught up into this communion of love. And that's why our relationships with one another are so important. That's why loving one another, that's why being brothers and sisters together uh, is of the essence of, of who we are and who we were created to be. The third area of rediscovery that Pope John Paul II in this document picks out as the Holy Spirit restoring a focus to us is a rediscovery of the power of Pentecost which will make possible a new evangelization. He basically says that 1700 years of Christian civilization is collapsing. You know, ever since Constantine became a Christian and Christianity became legal, then it became the state religion that Christian culture has been something that's been characteristic of, of the Western countries, and that now 1,700 years of Christian culture is collapsing or entering a new situation, very much like the early church was in, where we're now a minority surrounded by an aggressive international pagan culture, and that we need to rediscover the power of the Holy Spirit that the early church experience, starting on the day of Pentecost, in order to be able to carry out a new effort of proclamation of the gospel in a new cultural situation. I'll be speaking about that third rediscovery of the power of the Holy Spirit for a new evangelization uh, tomorrow night at St. Thomas Church. Tonight I want to focus on the first of those rediscoveries, the rediscovery of the universal call to holiness. Now, when we hear the word holiness, we're somewhat inclined to say, yes, but. You know, our, our response, most often, as I've found talking with people and in my own life as well, is, yes, I know I'm called to holiness, but. But I'm just a lay person. It's, it's those priests and nuns that are really called to holiness, you know. You know, I've got financial pressures. I've got, you know, challenges trying to figure out the emotions of teenage daughters. I've got you know, economic concerns, I've got relationship concerns, you know, I've, I've got job concerns, and, you know, those priests and nuns and pastors don't have to worry about any of that, you know, they're just completely free to devote themselves to responding to God, and maybe when I retire, I'll be able to uh, devote myself more completely to this call. And there's all different kinds of ways in which we pass the buck, we procrastinate, we rationalize, and a correct understanding of holiness would lead us to understand that to, to pull back from the call to holiness, to pull back from the possibility of bringing our will into complete union with God's will, to pull back from saying yes to the invitation to love with everything that we are, is to really pull back from our own happiness. The call to holiness isn't a burden that God is placing on us. It's a gift he's offering, the gift of uh, healing of the disordered desires in our life, healing of the griefs, the sorrows, the wounds, uh, the effects of what we call sin. And, and to, to, re, to call back, to resist, to draw back from the call to holiness is to draw back from an invitation to freedom, an invitation to love, an invitation to joy. And so John Paul II is saying that this is it's really important that every single baptized Christian really understands that this call to be a saint, this call to be holy, uh, is, is really and truly addressed to every one of us. And to postpone our response, to postpone, postpone saying yes, is to postpone our own happiness. 
the root of all the unhappiness in our lives is somehow related to sin, original sin, the wound in our human nature, uh, the particular personal actions that we do that harm ourselves and harm other people, and that the possibility of healing, the possibility of, of having our scattered energies and our scattered faculties of our soul gathered together into a unity and a harmony uh, it's just a tremendous gift that God is giving. Now another thing that's important to realize is that the only people who are in heaven are saints. And so if we want to be in heaven, we got to be a saint. Now what it means to be a saint doesn't necessarily be a canonized saint, but it means to be somebody who has completely said yes to God and completely uh, let God bring about the reordering of our personality uh, uh, bring us into harmony completely with his will. But, you know, what would happen if a, a jealous person got into heaven? They'd have a nervous breakdown. They'd say, well, you know, you know, your mansion is bigger than my mansion, or, you know, or, you know, you know, it just, heaven is heaven because of the complete union with God's will and the complete union with each other and the complete giving over to love. And so, one way or another, that has to happen in us in order for us to be completely one with God. Now, for those of us here tonight who are Catholics, and I know since this is partly sponsored by a Catholic parish that many of you might be, I, I want to add this, even though uh, brothers and sisters who are not Catholics wouldn't relate to this in, 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 in quite the same way, but a lot of us Catholics take some comfort in the doctrine of purgatory, like, you know, what's the rush, you know? This is going to get taken care of sooner or later. You know, it doesn't get taken care of on earth. You know, there's always purgatory, you know. Well, there's, 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 there's a couple problems with that way of relating to the doctrine of purgatory for those of us who are Catholics. One is that to wait for freedom doesn't make sense. To, to wait for joy doesn't make sense. To wait for love doesn't make sense. And that the more we can be surrender to God's will in this life, the more we're going to be a blessing to other people, uh, the more our life is going to reach the purpose for which it was created, and it just doesn't make sense to wait. Now, there's an even a bigger problem. You know, we don't always hit the target that we aim for. And if we're aiming for purgatory and miss, there's not a good backup. You know, the other backup is hell, I hear, you know? You know, so... The whole message of the scripture, the whole message of Jesus is, it isn't manana, it's now. Now is the acceptable time, now is the hour, now is the opportunity. Don't postpone, don't procrastinate, don't rationalize. Now is the acceptable time because God wasn't, doesn't want to delay his gift of love. God wasn't, doesn't want to delay his, his gift of union with himself. Okay, now... John Paul II is just absolutely strong on how this message is so important for the health of the church. He says, the time has come to repropose wholeheartedly to everyone this high standard of ordinary Christian living. He says, when people are being welcomed into the church, he says, to ask catechumens, do you wish to receive baptism, means at the same time to ask them, do you wish to become holy? It means to set before them the radical nature of the Sermon on the Mount, become perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect, quoting Matthew chapter 5. Now, in many Catholic parishes, and this may be true in other places as well, I don't know, when you ask somebody why they're joining the Catholic Church, they may, might say something like this, well, you know, to bring peace in the family, or my wife's been after me for 20 years, I'm going to make her happy on her 20th anniversary, or, you know, whatever. And, those, and there may be certainly deeper reasons under, under, under the surface there. But here Pope John Paul II says the purpose, the reason to become a Christian is because you want to say yes to the, to the, to the journey, to the spiritual journey. You want to say yes to the call to holiness. That's, that's why you're becoming a Christian. You want redemption. You want salvation to work its way into every part of your life and prepare you for eternity, to prepare you to see God face to face. Uh, now, it's interesting what the Pope says 
we need to do in order to respond to this call. He says we need to reconnect with the mystical tradition of the church. This is kind of this kind of wild and radical. You know, I had been for about ten or twelve years before I read this document, I had been led this direction myself. You know, from one of these doctors of the church to another. And when I when I read the Pope saying that the whole church needs to reconnect with the mystical church, I was saying, "Wow, this is what he says." He says, we need to do this because there's a hunger for spirituality in the world today. Even in postmodern, secularized environments, there's a hunger for meaning. And people are doing all kinds of things to find meaning. They're, they're rubbing crystals. They're, they're, you know, they're doing all different kinds of things to find meaning and contact and purpose in life. And we have in our tradition as a church this tremendous depth of richness of how you really can come into intimate contact with Christ and how you can grow deeper and deeper in union with the Lord. And he says we need to recover, uh, uncover this tradition and make it accessible today. And this is what he says, because this tradition will show us, and this is an exact quote from section 32 of Novo Millennium and Iwente, this tradition will show us to, to what depths the relationship with Christ can lead. He says, this tradition will show us how prayer can progress as a genuine dialogue of love, even to the point of rendering the person wholly possessed by the Divine Beloved. Pretty powerful description of union with Jesus. Wholly possessed by the Divine Beloved, vibrating at the Spirit's touch, resting filially within the Father's heart. So the mystic wisdom of the saints will show us the depth of union that's possible with each person of the Trinity, resting in the heart of the Father with the security of a son or daughter, sensitivity to the moving and breathing of the Holy Spirit and the, and the daily inspirations He wants to give, uh, being completely belonging to the divine beloved, Jesus Christ. So this kind of Trinitarian union. Then the Pope says, this isn't just for a few wacko Italian mystics. This is a very loose translation from the Latin. <laughs> what he actually says is that this is scriptural. This isn't something out in left field. This isn't something kind of idiosyncratic. This isn't something for people who like that kind of thing. This is unfolding the meaning of Scripture where in John's Gospel, and he quotes particularly John 14, 21, He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. That whole, those whole kind of luminous passages in John's Gospel, uh, John 17 and 14 and John 16, where he's talking about this depth of communion with the Lord and with one another that's almost so luminous that it blinds us. And, and Pope John Paul II is saying is that the wisdom of these saints will lead us into the appropriation of these promises of Jesus in the Gospel. So this is like biblical spirituality. This is unfolding the spirituality of the Bible, Trinitarian communion that Jesus promises in these luminous chapters of John. He also says that this isn't just something for us as individuals, but this is how parishes and congregations of the future need to move as communities. He says parishes and, and congregations in the future need to provide training in holiness. He says, our Christian, this is an exact quote, our Christian communities must become genuine schools of prayer where the meeting with Christ is expressed not just in imploring help, but also in thanksgiving, praise, adoration, contemplation, listening, and ardent devotion until the heart truly falls in love. So our, our parishes, our Christian communities are places where Maybe people come asking for what they need, which is always a good thing to do. That prayer doesn't drop away, but it, it broadens and it deepens to include 
praise and thanksgiving and adoration and contemplation until the heart falls in love. So the, the mission statement for the parish of the new millennium is a place where people grow in depth and breadth of communion with Christ until they fall in love and, and, and wholeheartedly say yes to the, the spiritual journey. The Pope also says it would be wrong to think that ordinary Christians can be content with a shallow prayer that is unable to fill their whole life. One of the founders of a renewal movement in the Catholic Church, the Curcio movement, uh, Bishop Juan Hervas from Spain, said that one of the things that's weakening the life of the Catholic Church, and it's true of other churches as well, is that we're asking f from Catholics less than the Gospel asks, and we're offering to Catholics less than the Gospel offers. You know, what does the Gospel ask? Jesus says, like, everything, you know? You know, everything, I mean, I want you. I, I was... I was at this uh, conference once, and they invited like a Pentecostal preacher to take up the offering. It was an ecumenical conference, and Pentecostal preachers are really good at taking up the collection. You know, us Catholics kind of mumble and say we're going to pass the basket around for something or other. If you want to, you can do something. But Pentecostal preachers really preach the collection. So this Pentecostal preacher got up. And he says, it's time to take up the offering. And people started taking money out of their wallets. He says, put those money back into the wallet. Don't you even think of tipping the Lord. Put your whole wallet in the collection. <laughs> so, uh, but the idea is that the Lord wants all of us because he wants to, to love all of us. He wants to heal all of us. He doesn't want any part of us to, to be left in darkness. He doesn't want any part of us to be left withered or constricted or turned in on ourselves. He wants every part of us to, to be open to his love and open to love. Okay, now, now I'm going to talk about specific wisdom that the saints give about different stages of the journey. The Pope actually picks out four principles that we find in these doctors of the church in the area of spirituality. He says the first principle is that the spiritual journey is totally dependent on the grace of God. You can't become holy no matter what you do. What you do helps, but it's not, it's not adequate. Holiness is a gift from God. John of the Cross frequently says we can dispose ourselves for the action of God, and it's really important that we dispose ourselves for the action of God. But it's the action of God that brings about transformation in our life. One of the doctors of the church that's so good at communicating this in a very vivid way is St. Therese of Lisieux. Uh, she was very, very eager to enter the Carmelite convent. She tried to enter before 16 years old, and she got in a couple months early, but she caused a big fuss to, to do it. And she dies at the age of 24. And seven years into her life in the convent, it's only, she just has another year ago before she dies, she writes in the story of her soul, her, her account of her life, and she says, almost every time I try to pray, even after receiving communion, I fall asleep. So I, she's never been officially designated as, but I nominate her as the patron saint of sleepy prayers. <laughs> And she says, you'd think I'd be absolutely discouraged. Because my whole life is Carmelitis prayer, and I'm falling asleep almost every time I pray. She says, well, you know, I'm not discouraged. She says, you know why I'm not discouraged? It's because I know that God loves me even while I'm sleeping. You know, there's a line in one of the Psalms that says, the Lord gives to his beloved while she sleeps. So if you're looking for a scripture passage to claim, that's one. The Lord gives to his beloved even while she sleeps. And she says, I also know that God loves me even though I'm falling asleep during prayer. It's because I see that earthly parents love their children even while they're sleeping. You know, as a parent, I might add, sometimes we love our children even more while they're sleeping. <laughs> thank God they've stopped screaming. You know, thank God they finally want to sleep. Don't they look cute there now that they're quiet? That she says, I also know that God loves me while I'm sleeping because I see that surgeons put their patients to sleep when they're doing important surgery. So Therese's confidence wasn't in the quality of her prayer time. 
Trez's confidence was in the power of God's love and mercy to take the little loaves and fishes that she was able to offer and that the Lord would turn them into something beautiful for God. And that's always going to be the case. Whatever we bring to the Lord is going to be as nothing compared to what the Lord is going to do. All we can do is bring our loaves and fishes, but it's really important to bring our loaves and fishes. A little later on in her life, uh, Therese's um, couple, well, she, she, she writes in her story of a soul, she says, you know, I really want to be a saint, but I don't think I've got what it takes. I, I, can, I can identify with that. And she says, I wonder if there's a shortcut for people like me. She says, I'm not attracted to all those, you know, incredible penances that some of the saints do. I'm just, I'm just not attracted to that. I don't think I can do it. She says, I wonder if there's a shortcut for somebody like me. And so she's praying in one of her probably unsleepy times, and she feels like the Lord shows her that there is a shortcut. And the shortcut, well, first of all, she explains that she notices that there's elevators now being used in late 19th century France in the homes of rich people. She says, I wonder if there's something like a spiritual elevator. And then she feels like God the Father shows her that there is a spiritual elevator, and that the spiritual elevator is the arms of Jesus. And then she writes, Once I took my place in the arms of Jesus, it was amazing what I was then able to see. She rested on the Father's heart, allowing herself to be possessed by the Divine Beloved, vibrating at the touch of the Spirit. She had changed her position from looking at God from the perspective of the world to looking at the world from within the heart of the Trinity. A, a journey that the Lord is inviting us all to make. And then just before she was dying, she was suffocating from tuberculosis. She only had one half of one lung still functioning a few months short of her death. And she was in the infirmary of the convent and she must have they were maybe changing the pillows on her bed or something like that, and she, she made an impatient remark to one of the other, other nuns. And she was corrected right away. Like, you know, sister, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be impatient. Now, if that was me, I'd kind of gasp out, couldn't you cut me a little slack, you know? <laughs> couldn't you forbear something? Don't you know about the scripture passage that says forbear? You know, the Lord's going to take care of this in a few months, you know? That wasn't her response. Her response was, oh good, another fault to bring to the mercy of Christ. So she wasn't embarrassed to see things in her life that weren't quite transformed yet come to the surface. She saw it as an opportunity. She didn't want any darkness in her life. Whenever darkness came up, she saw it as an opportunity to expose it to the light of Christ. She was glad to have things uncovered because she didn't want anything in her life that was not in harmony with God. So she saw the exposure of faults and imperfections as an opportunity rather than as an embarrassing occurrence. Second principle of the spiritual journey. First principle is totally dependent on the grace of God. Second principle is that nevertheless it demands an intense spiritual commitment. The intense spiritual commitment isn't sufficient to bring about transformation, but it's necessary. Anybody's taking a logic class, it's a necessary but not sufficient. So what is this spiritual commitment? What, what are examples of this spiritual commitment? Well, St. Francis de Sales says, we need to start facing our life in the direction of God. We need to reorganize our life so as much as possible, as much as possible, it's facing towards God. As much as possible, we're opening the different areas of our life uh, to the Lord. I know in my own life, you know, I had to make some decisions. Uh, I had gotten confused in the confusion of the 60s at Notre Dame, and it was, it was making this uh, weekend retreat called the Crucio that really helped me to rediscover the person of Christ and repent and be reconciled to, to Jesus and the church. But a, a few weeks later, I knew I needed to make some additional decisions that God had really shown His grace and mercy to me on that weekend retreat on that Curcio and had given me the grace of repentance, the grace of renewed faith, 
And that was really his doing. But I knew I had to make some decisions for this not to kind of, you know, drift away. I, I, and so what I did about two weeks after making this retreat, just before I graduated from Notre Dame, I decided to take some time each day for personal prayer. Just a simple decision, not mysterious, not magical, not complicated, just to take some time each day for personal prayer, just to face in God's direction. Uh, you know, a lot of those prayer times have been sleepy, distracted. You know, when, when guys start to pray, they think about what, what, when their next meal's coming and when they're going to eat and stuff like that, you know, and uh, all, the work, all the work that you have to do and, you know, is this a waste of time and, you know, all those kinds of things. And I can't say I've been anywhere near 100% faithful, but almost every day I, I take some time for personal prayer just to be with the Lord. Uh, it's been at different times in my day, at different stages of my life, but right now what my wife and myself do, we go to a 7 o'clock morning Mass at a local parish in Ann Arbor, Michigan, where I come from, and we stay after Mass to take a time of personal prayer. You know, we get our little Magnificat books out. Do you have that out here in Iowa? You know, and you know, if we're feeling particularly inspired after Mass, we, we'll just kind of pray and just be there and be with the Lord, but then we start to get distracted. We get our Magnificat books out, and that helps us get refocused and uh, just to kind of be with the Lord. Simple, nothing, nothing complex. And that just has really been so, so important, you know, in, in, in my life. Another thing that the wisdom of the saints tells us is that making some decisions about sin is really, really important. I'm going to run through some of these decisions that Francis de Sales tells us is really, really helpful. It really makes a difference in accelerating the process of transformation. One of the things the saints tell us is that sin never helps. I've never heard it said that bluntly. Sin never helps. Sin always presents itself as a solution to a problem. Hey, we need money. Maybe I'll just borrow some from my employer for a while until I can pay him back. Never helps. You know, you, when, you're, when you're sitting in jail for embezzlement, you're going to say, gee, I probably shouldn't have done that, you know? Even if you don't get found out, you've done something that's wounded your own soul and done an injustice to your employer. Uh, sometimes, you, you know, I feel like, well, I've got this temptation and it's, and it's causing so much distress in my life. If I just give in to it, it'll be over. Sin never helps. Sin always wounds the soul. Sin, all, sin always damages the person who does the thing that's in opposition to, to the truth about ourselves and the truth about the world and the truth about other people. It's a violation of, of what we are constructed to be. It's not, a, it's not an arbitrary external imposition. Sin is an identification of what wounds human beings, what, you, what, what wounds the soul, what, you, what wounds relationships. It's the, the law of God is, is a blessing that says, hey, this way health and happiness, this way misery, this way, this way sorrow, this way suffering. It's, it's an intent to guide us to the the promised land of, 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 of transformation. So the saints say you got you to get rid of serious sin. You got you got to turn away from it, and it can take a while. It can be a struggle. You know, Augustine's struggle. You know, Lord, make me chase, but not right now. You know, uh, the you know becoming of one mind and one heart, getting over double mindedness can take take a while. You know, uh, even when we want to get over a, a serious sin. It, we may have become addicted to it in certain ways. And, and Augustine said that when he was trapped in sin, he was really trapped. He says, I didn't have the freedom to stop doing what I was doing. He was trapped in sexual sin. But he said, I was responsible for having gotten to that point because I made decisions much earlier in my life and I kept deciding and redeciding and redeciding. And at this point, I really wasn't free anymore, but I was responsible for having gotten there. But he he cried out to the Lord. He tried to get free, and he couldn't on his own strength, but God's grace and mercy came to him, and he got free. And that will be true for everybody who, who makes that effort and perseveres. But the saints also tell us that lesser sins uh, can really hold us back from the process of transformation and spiritual journey, what the traditional distinction in Catholic popular theology between mortal sin, serious sin, and venial sin, less serious sin. 
And Teresa of Avila and Francis de Sales make an important distinction. They don't want us to become scrupulous. They say there's such a thing as inadvertent little sins, and there's such a thing as advertent little sins. And by inadvertent little sins, it's those kind of half thought out, not fully chosen kind of that little mean word that comes out without thinking about it too much, or that little white lie that comes comes out because of embarrassment. You know, maybe maybe you know one of your roommates you know likes to keep a really neat dorm room. You know, and um, you know you've kind of spilled something by mistake or forgot to clean up the bathroom or something, and your roommate comes in and says, "Who did this?" And out of fear or out of shame or embarrassment, you say the dog did it. You know, you know I mean, it isn't like you thought about it in a cool, collected way and decided you're going to purposely deceive your roommate. Just out of shame or embarrassment, it just came out. Those little inadvertent venial sins. Teresa Avila says the biblical basis for this is when it says in the book of Proverbs that the just person sins seven times a day. The just person falls seven times a day. You're living basically a righteous life, but there's these inadvertent things that come from our wounded human nature that become less as time goes on. But the saints say those don't really significantly hold us back. But what does significantly hold us back is freely choosing to offend the Lord even in small matters. And Teresa of Avila describes it like this. She says, I know the Lord doesn't want me to do this, but it's only a small sin, and I'm got, I want to do it anyway. She says, that's no small sin, because it's an offense in a love relationship. Now just imagine, you know, if you treated a friend like that, or in a, in a spousal relationship, husband-wife relationship, you say, gee, dear, you know, I know you don't like me to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway because I really like to do it. That would put a little chill in the relationship, wouldn't it? I mean, that would put a little distance. And that's what happens in our relationship with the Lord. It just puts a little chill, a little distance. Not from the Lord's part, but from our part. We're kind of pulling back from love. We're offending against love. And Teresa of Avila says, it really makes a difference in speeding up the spiritual journey to make a clear decision. She says it like this, I'd rather die a thousand deaths than voluntarily choose to offend the Lord, even in a small matter. That the meaning of love grows in our life. The meaning of fidelity grows in our life. The meaning of loyalty grows in our life. Our sensitivity to the love relationship that this is all about grows. Because these mystic saints aren't primarily teaching techniques of prayer. Uh, some of them do teach some techniques of prayer. But what they're primarily teaching is a relationship. They're primarily teaching about what it means to be in relationship with an immense interpersonal love and what it means to be faithful and what it means to respond. They're not teaching techniques, they're teaching relationship. Now, this other thing here, well, another thing the saints say about, about sin is they say that the, uh, I'll stop by eight, okay, is that okay? Okay, I, I promise I'll stop by eight, okay. And whatever I don't cover, you can, you can read in the book. <laughs> no, no, eight, eight, eight. I, I want to do unto others as I would have them do unto me, you know? I, I wouldn't want a speaker to speak more than an hour. He started at 8. I, I started at 8, okay. Anyway. Um, oh, yeah, I started at 8, so 9. Start, start at 9. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you, thank you. Uh, one of the things the saints say is that the best way to defeat a temptation to offend the Lord is that the instant you become aware of it, treat it like a devil. Treat it like an enemy. Catherine of Siena says, a temptation, treat it like the serpent's head and step on it. Get tough. You know, don't be nice to, to a lie. Don't be nice to an evil suggestion. That the, every second delay, it becomes harder to overcome the temptation. So don't, don't play with the temptation. Don't dally with it. Don't th say, how far can I go and deriving some pleasure of thinking about killing my neighbor, but I'll stop short and not kill him. That's, that's already muddying the soul. That's already weakening our will. That's already 
bringing a little bit of darkness into our life that's going to show itself in one way or another down the road. Uh, somebody told me a story about in the desert, you have these tents. And when, when a camel tries to get into a tent, first he puts his nose under the tent, you know. And what they say is that unless you step on his nose really, really hard right away, the camel is going to get into your tent. And they say it's really hard to get the camel out once he gets in. He's bigger than you. And so that's, that's how you deal with temptation, wisdom from the saints. Deal with it the first instant you become aware that, you're, that something evil is being suggested to you. Just, just say no. Now this next thing I never heard about. I don't know whether I was uh, asleep in catechism class or religion class in the Sisters of Charity in New Jersey or was looking out the window when the Irish Christian brothers were teaching me in high school or whatever, was, was too full of kind of rebellion in college. Uh, but I never heard this before. And it's what Francis de Sales talks about as affection for sin. What he says is sometimes you can stop doing a particular sin, but still nurture an affection for it in your heart. And he says it was like when the Israelites were brought out of slavery from Egypt into the Promised Land, they were no longer physically in slavery, but their hearts were still tied to Egypt. You know, they'd complain and say, oh man, I'm getting tired of these daily boring miracles, you know, manna in the morning and quails at night, same old, same old. Boy, the leeks and garlic in Egypt were really good. Man, I wish we could have that again, you know, just that. So they were still tied to Egypt in their heart. So Francis gives an example. He says there's a doctor who tells his patient, if you keep eating melons, you're going to die. Probably, you know, huge allergic reaction to melons. So the person doesn't want to die, so he stops eating melons. But he says, you know, I can still go to the fruit market and look at them. I can still touch them. I can still smell them. I can still talk to the people who are buying melons about how I wish I could be buying them too and how I really, really enjoyed it when I could be. It's too bad I'm going to die if I eat them, but I really like to. And so he's no longer eating melons, but he's nurturing an affection for melons in his heart, a nostalgic memory of future hope. And Francis gives two, two particular examples. He talks about a young man who's been converted, and he used to really get into fights all the time at bars and pubs, and when, when anybody would look at him cross-eyed, he'd kind of punch him out. And he says, now he's a Christian, he says, he goes back to the bars and pubs, and somebody looks at him cross-eyed, he says, oh man, I wish I could punch that guy out. Boy, I really used to know how to handle the situation. Why can't us Christians kind of beat people up more easily, you know? And, and so he's no longer taking revenge, because he's been taught, revenge is his mind, says the Lord, I will repay. But he's, he's nurturing an affection for it. Then one last example, Francis de Sales talks about a married woman who doesn't want to destroy her family, but would like to be flirted with, would like to be propositioned. She, she intends to say no, but she'd like to flirt. And so Francis says that's nurturing an affection for something that's really muddying the soul and, and, and slowing us down our journey for God. And she says, ask the Holy Spirit to help you identify any way in which you're nurturing an affection for sin, holding on to a memory from the past, or maybe a hope for the future. Maybe like you say to yourself, well, maybe someday the church will change its teaching on this, you know, so I'll just kind of keep this little door open just in case, you know. But in order to make progress on the spiritual journey, we need to close some doors. We need to close some doors on the past and close some wishful thinking for the future and just with joy embrace the path that the Lord has for us, you know, and, and, and re rejoice that it's a path of mercy and a path of love and a path of healing and a path of freedom. Okay, one more area. The third principle of the spiritual journey is that sometimes it's painful. Sometimes there's painful purifications. What John of the Cross talks about is dark night. And then I'll tell you the fourth principle, even though I won't have time to talk about it. Pope John Paul II says, one of the things we learn from the wisdom of the saints is that this journey is so worth it because it leads, even in this life, to a depth of union, a habitual union with the Lord uh, that the mystics talk about as spiritual marriage or transforming union. We won't, I won't talk, have time to talk about the fourth uh, element, but I'm going to talk now about the painful purification and dark night uh, in my remaining seven minutes. 
Why, why are there painful dimensions to the journey? Well, because sin wounds the soul. Uh, we, we turn in ourselves, we become withered, we become protective, we're, we're guarding ourselves, we're, we have all kinds of compensation things going on, we, uh, things have gotten crooked, twisted, and the process of expanding our heart and mind so it's able to receive and give love, it's, it, there's, there's painful dimensions to that. I experienced this very vividly about a year and a half ago. I had rotator cuff surgery. I was trying too hard to beat my son-in-law in tennis. And uh, I had rotator cuff surgery. And I would have to tell you the cure was worse than the disease. The physical therapy was terrible. I should have just taken some more Advil and not, not told my wife about it, you know. She made me go to the doctor. But, but you know the stretching, the pulling, and I had this Israeli physical therapist who used to be like a commando in the army, and she'd, she'd really, she'd really, you know, pull and stretch pretty hard. I'd say, you know, are you, are you sure, you know, you're not going too far? Are you sure it's not going to break? Are you sure? You know, she's, oh, I know what I'm doing, man. I said, well, you know, you know, I'm thinking maybe I don't really care if I play tennis anymore, so why don't we just stop right here, you know? And, oh, she's, oh, you're going to thank me for this someday, you know, I just kept on pulling and pushing, and twist it and turn and and, uh, and sometimes it's like that you know as the Lord is straightening those twisted parts and expanding those withered shrunken parts that there's painful dimensions to it now one of the nor one of the common ways in which this happens is through aridity or dryness or darkness in our relationship with the Lord where we're not experiencing his presence or experiencing his love or experiencing his favor maybe we feel cut off Maybe we feel abandoned. Maybe we feel like there's no contact anymore between God and us. It's just kind of blank, you know. You've lost that loving feeling. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay. It's an oldie. It's an oldie. Okay. You know, when, when you lose the loving feeling, you know, and, and it's just not there. Well, there's, there's early stages of this that are just normal growth and development, but there's deeper purifications. And... John of the Cross says, in the initial stages of spiritual life, it's like the Lord is cutting off the weeds at the, at, the, at the level of the surface of the ground, but the roots are still under there. You know, there isn't kind of wild kind of growth, you know, anymore. It's been cut back by the, by the Lord, but the roots are still there. And at some point, the Lord goes after the roots. And He can go after them in one fell swoop by a really sustained purification operation, or He can do it in intervals. And he knows perfectly well how to guide each one of us in this process. Now, an equally important thing to know is that not every experience of dryness or aridity or emptiness in our relationship with God or prayer is the dark night. And almost everything that happens to somebody that doesn't feel good is called the dark night. But John of the Cross says there's actually three reasons why we may be experiencing aridity or dryness or emptiness in our relationship with God, or in our Christian service, or in our relationships. He says the first is because of carelessness or lukewarmness. We're not doing principle number two. We're not doing our part. We're not being faithful to prayer. We're not being faithful to participating in the sacraments. We're not being faithful to spiritual reading, reading the scripture. We're not saying no to temptation instantly. We're playing with it. We're not ordering our life as much as we can towards God. We're allowing all kinds of uh, distraction, entertainment, uh, junk into our life. We're just allowing our culture to fill our minds and hearts with things that take away our desire for God. You know, our culture doesn't want us to think about God. It wants us to think about our buying the next car or the next beauty treatment, you know. You know, one of the one of the proverbs says, "Love wisdom more than beauty," and our culture is telling us to love beauty more than wisdom. So, if we're just uncritically allowing ourselves to flow with our culture, the hunger for God is going to disappear. The desire for God is going to disappear. There has to be some some discrimination, some discernment, some some moderation in what we participate in and how we do it. So John says that one of the reasons why we may be experiencing emptiness or dryness is this kind of carelessness and laziness and lukewarmness in our, in our life. We're not practicing the spiritual practices that keep us pointed towards God. <clears throat> 
Teresa of Avila says the only solution for that first kind of dryness that's come about as a result of our carelessness or infidelity is repentance. It's not a mysterious dark night. It's very clear why it's happened. And she says, unfortunately, the only solution is to start praying again. There's no magic bullet. There's no shortcut. You just got to get back into spiritual condition. And it's a little bit like physical condition. You know, if you're used to walking a couple miles a day or jogging or whatever, and you stop doing it for a couple of months and you go back, it's hard. So it's better not to get out of condition in the first place, you know? It's just better not to. Second reason why we may be experiencing dryness or emptiness in our relationship with God is because of physical or emotional illness. And what the saints say, they're very practical. Francis the Sale says, hey, try to get better. You know, pray for healing. Go to the doctor. Do what the doctor tells you. Uh, but then he says, if you don't get better, you know, God's in control, and he may have for a short period of time or a long period of time a plan for you to grow in, in, in union with him through your illness. And don't waste your illness. You know, connect it to the suffering of Christ. You know, turn it into prayer. Turn it into surrender. Turn it into offering. Turn it into acceptance of the providential will of God, you know. Keep taking your medicine. Keep praying for healing. But in the meantime, don't waste the participation and suffering that the Lord is allowing you to have. He, he's got a plan for good. Teresa of Avila says, hey, adjust your life if you're sick. You know, don't, don't try to have that morning prayer time if that's not a good time for you anymore. Uh, if, if you're having a really tough time even, even focusing on prayer at all, do something good for somebody else. You know, just get out of yourself and, and stay connected to Christ even through faith, even though the feelings aren't there and even though it's hard. The third reason why we may be experiencing emptiness or dryness or feeling being cut off from God is because of this purifying dark night. And what this is, John tells us, is that sometimes the Lord purposely removes the experience of presence, love, and favor in order to give us a chance to mature and go more deeply in believing and hoping and loving. And he uses examples like a mother if she always held the baby and never put it down and let it, let it try to walk even though it was painful, even though the baby fell, uh, the baby would never grow strong and mature, muscles would never develop, aspects of things would never click in, and the Lord wants us to mature and grow and deepen. Uh, Catherine of Siena says there's, she, you know, many of the saints talk about three stages of the spiritual life, the purgative, the illuminative, and the unitive, and I'm not going to go into that because I only have a minute left, but uh, she says in that middle stage of, of the illuminative way where you're making progress in virtue and you know, you're living a pretty godly life, there's, there's still a mercenary element. You're still following the Lord because of what you're getting from Him. And there's, there's, there's a deeper and purer love that the Lord wants to lead you to where you just love God for Himself no matter what you're getting or not getting. It, you've just gotten into that kind of love relationship with Him. So sometimes the Lord takes away the experience of these things in order to give us a chance to believe without seeing, to hope without possessing, and to love without necessarily being loved in return or having the experience of being loved in return. So there's a, there's a lot of tremendous wisdom uh, in, in these saints. And one of the things, I, I'm, I'm closing now, one of the things that I discovered is I had grown up with a very kind of separated picture of the spiritual schools in, in our tradition, like here's the Franciscan, and here's the Dominican, and here's the Jesuit, here's the Carmelites, and here's the Benedictine, and you kind of choose your flavor. But as I was studying these doctors of the church, I was more struck by their commonality than by their differences. <coughs> and I was really struck by, if you brought together the wisdom from each of them, you'd have an amazingly comprehensive picture of the journey to God. You know, and, and amazingly harmonious. Uh, some have deeper insights in one area, others have deeper insights in another area, but it's amazing how much is there and how much is available that's been revealed to us through these doctors of the church that can really help us a great deal in the spiritual journey. So that's when I try to put it all together in the book called The Fulfillment of All Desire, a guidebook for the journey to God based on the wisdom of the saints, and I'd be happy to sign copies if anybody would like them. Um, and I'm also happy to take some questions if anybody would like to ask some questions. But uh, thanks for your uh, patience and your attention. Okay. Also, we do have a...
I do have individual CD albums on each saint and their whole spiritual teaching. Uh, and you can get them on our website. And our website is www.renewalministries.net. And they'll also be available tomorrow night at St. Thomas Aquinas. But uh, we, So there are individual CD albums. So when you're driving you know, to Des Moines or something, you can pop in John of the Cross or pop in Teresa, Teresa of Avila and have a great companion on the journey. And then the book puts, puts it all together uh, in, a, in an orderly, clear way. That, and one of the things I'm really excited about is that the wisdom is available to people of every and no educational background. I mean, all kinds of professors at universities have said how helpful it's been, but all kinds of ordinary folks with no theological education are also find it accessible. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. Okay. Now, this mic works. So this mic is available. Maybe. This mic might be available. If you have some questions for Ralph, I'd ask you to come and, and speak them into the microphone so that everybody can listen. And I'll start with a question, Ralph. Uh, so recently, this last year, there was a, a lot written about Mother Teresa oh, yeah. and, and some, you know, maybe associated with this last topic that you talked about, the dark night of the soul, and I wonder if you had anything you sure. want to say about that. Sure. Also, we might want to say, what time is it at St. Thomas Aquinas tomorrow? Is it 7 or 7.15? 7 or 7.15. 7 7 7 at St. Thomas Aquinas, we'll be talking about the, the third area of rediscovery, power of the Holy Spirit for evangelization, so you're all welcome to that, too. Uh, yeah, there was a lot of, you know, Time Magazine had a cover and all kinds of interviews and articles and books about this surprising discovery that for almost 50 years Mother Teresa was in this kind of state of, of, of aridity or emptiness, not, not experiencing the Lord's presence or his favor or, or his love like she used to in the early years of founding uh, her order. In the early years of founding her order she had remarkable communion with the Lord, and remarkable you know exchanges and the Lord speaking to her and everything like that and then except for short respites here and there, it was pretty much, pretty much kind of tough going. And, and people were sort of shocked and saying, we, you know, you know, and, and her, her letters were published and some of them were saying, Lord, are you really there? And you know, some of the, you know, the atheist literature that's growing up kind of pounced on that. So I see Mother Teresa was really an atheist, you know, and didn't really believe in God, was just doing you know, good things for people, just a social worker. But if you, I, I've read the whole book, and I've read all the letters, and I've actually written an article on it. And what you really see happening there in Mother Teresa isn't the classical dark night that John of the Cross talks about. Uh, that certainly in the early stages, there was purification going on, maybe aspects of this dark night, this purifying uh, aridity and dryness. But there's, there's three other things going on in a special way with her, and I think Father Renero Cantolamesa, the preacher to the papal household, several years ago identified this just, just from his knowledge of these letters. One of the things that's going on here is a special provision that the Lord is making for the nature of her vocation. One is that she's going to be ministering to the, the abandoned, the forsaken, people rejected, people who are out on the sidewalks, you know, who have been thrown out of their families or don't have families, uh, they're, they're completely rejected and abandoned. And the Lord was allowing her to experience that as a way of empathizing with and having compassion for those that she was being sent to. She, she knew what it felt like. She wasn't lying on a sidewalk, but she knew what it felt like to be experiencing alone without support, you know, type of thing. Another thing is the Lord knew how the whole world was going to, you know, just immense adulation was going to kind of flood to her. You know, she's going to win the Nobel Peace Prize. Everybody loved Mother Teresa, you know, that type of thing. And in order to protect her from pride, in order to protect her from thinking that it was her doing, the Lord allowed her to experience this continued state of spiritual poverty. So she just felt just so dependent on the Lord and so empty and so like it couldn't be coming from her. She said she could see 
that when she was speaking to her sisters that spiritual life was coming to them, but she wasn't experiencing it at all. So she could see the hand of the Lord, but she couldn't feel spiritually powerful. So she couldn't feel like it was her. You know, it was like the spiritual poverty that the Lord is giving her as a protection against, against pride. And then the third thing is that early on in founding the order, she made a special prayer to the Lord. She said, Lord, I only want to know you in your agony and passion. So in some way she asked for a special share in, in the Lord's agony and passion. She maybe didn't remember that at times when it was really hard, but she, she prayed that. And it's, it's right there. You can read it in her, her telling about her prayer. So what happened to Mother Teresa isn't the normal dark night. It's not the normal purification that the Lord wants to bring us all through. It was something that was uniquely provided by the Lord to fit the special call that she was having. And it wasn't, it wasn't, for the most part, purifying. It was like a special participation in the passion of the Lord. I, I think chapter 18 in my book has some stuff on that, The Dark Knight. Well, we, we appreciated your um, uh, involvement with the church fathers and uh, various paths of holiness, particularly emphasis on prayer, emphasis on avoidance of sin. Uh, would you, could you elaborate a little bit on, uh, in, in terms of growing in holiness, uh, the need for sacrament of grace, and, and how it would be impossible to grow in holiness uh, without the sacrament of reconciliation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I was picking out some aspects of things that I thought would be of, of wide acceptance, knowing that this was a, a university lecture and there'd be people here who weren't Catholics. But certainly from a Catholic perspective, uh, the Eucharist is absolutely, you know, essential for, you know, growing and holiness, a very special, very, very special privilege, communion with Christ, you know, literally communion with Christ in the Eucharist. And the Sacrament of Reconciliation, you know, all the saints talk about how important it is as a way of keeping our, ourselves sensitive to uh, you know, to, to sin and keep keeping us sensitive to wanting to live in complete union with the Lord. And different saints recommend different frequencies. Francis de Sales recommends every week. You know, other people recommend monthly. Uh, some want daily. Uh, but yeah, the sacramental grace obviously is really, really important. Uh, and the, the saints do talk about that. They also say some amazing things about what we actually receive in the grace of sacrament of reconciliation or the, or the Eucharist depends, depends a great deal on the disposition that we come to the sacrament with. And they have some really devastating things about Like Francis de Sales says, if you don't plan to really change your life, don't bother going to the sacrament of reconciliation. Like they're, they're really kind of strong on our dispositions of sincere repentance and sincere, you know, that type of thing. So there's a lot of interesting things about our, our disposing ourselves to receive the graces of the sacrament and not just taking it as an automatic, even though we know as Catholics something automatically is happening. But its effectiveness in our life depends a lot on our, our preparation, our disposition. Being that this is a college campus, um, I've noticed something Yeah, there's, there's definitely like a culture of, uh, well, I don't, I don't know what, really what the word for it is, but, you know, um, y 
you you may you may get to heaven, but don't don't you want to live every moment on life, you know, on this earth, in, in in the most pleasing way to God possible? I mean, don't you want to every day be available to the Lord to do His will and carry out His mission? I mean, why would you want to waste any of the few moments that we have on earth? by not living it in its complete communion with the Lord and complete givenness to His will as possible. I mean, we're, we're just saying no to our happiness. We're saying no to the blessings that God wants to bring to other people through our lives. And so, why, you know, if you, if you really could see clearly, and one, one of the things the saints do, in chapter 4 of the book, it's called the Biblical Worldview of the Saints, they see so clearly the shortness of life and so clearly how quickly this life goes and how urgent it is that we come into union with God and, and, and live every day for His will. And why would you want to waste any of these precious time that the Lord gives on earth by living in anything else than union with Him? I mean, so. And then there's also a whole Catholic theology about degrees of glory. You know, uh, you know, we, we can get to heaven, but maybe we haven't. Uh, we haven't kind of reached the depth of union that was possible, but we, we just didn't, and so we're there, and we're, we're eternally happy, and we're very, we're very happy, but, you know, more was possible if we had responded more. Yeah. Um, your well, problem here is um, anger, trying to overcome anger um, when you're hurt by another. And the way you come across to me in this respect is that it's a, just a matter of getting over the hump. Um, what, well, for instance, when our Blessed Mother gave birth to our Savior, she didn't seek to understand everything, she just simply trusted. And I think that's the key. Mm -hmm. Everything. But for me to come to that is, I need some encouragement mm -hmm. from somebody else. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the things the saints do say is that spiritual friendship is really important. And, and you know, Francis de Sales says, you know, one of the first things we should ask God to give us is, is some spiritual friendship, either, you know, a spiritual director or a spiritual friend, somebody that can help us along the journey, somebody who can help us and guide us and encourage us. And you know, I, I mentioned about the decision I made to uh, take some time each day for personal prayer. Another decision I made that's really important is to uh, meet in a small group with other men to talk about how we're doing on the journey, to encourage each other to pray what, with one another, to uh, talk about how we're doing as husbands, fathers, workers, that, that type of thing. So I've been in a small group with other men for 40 years. And every two weeks I meet with, with some guys. And um, you know, the, the Composition has changed over the years. You know, I haven't had that much stability in my life, and uh, but that's that our connection with one another and our helping one another is really important, and and overcoming a particular thing like anger, getting prayer from other people can be really helpful. You know, kind of prayer for, for the ability to let go of hurts and to forgive and to receive healing for wounds from the past, things like that. Sometimes, the Lord can work through other people, uh, as we ask them for prayer. You know, uh, and lots of people have been helped to let go of anger and have received healing from some terrible things from the past by receiving prayer from brothers and sisters in Christ, you know, or, or counsel or advice from a spiritual director or confessor. Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah. Uh, you know, I Thanks for coming tonight. I want to make two announcements as we close our meeting tonight. One, just to remind you that uh, Ralph will be speaking tomorrow night just across the street, just across Lincoln Way, St. Thomas Aquinas Parish. 
who's going to speak on the Holy Spirit and evangelization. And it's going to, begins at 7.15. And since it's part of St. Thomas Aquinas' 60th anniversary, following his presentation, we'll invite everybody down for some anniversary cake and punch, okay? So come over there for, to listen to that talk tomorrow night. And also to help remind you, I made a few little sheets of paper with that information. It's on the table besides the book table. And that reminds me to remind you about the book table. If you're interested in the book, uh, especially Fulfillment of All Desire will be a great uh, Lenten read. Thank you for coming tonight. God bless you. Hope to see you soon. Especially tomorrow.